All right, well, good afternoon once again, everyone. We are going to get started. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for the TA Network's Early Childhood Learning Community. My name is Lauren Rabinowitz. I am usually joined by my co-host and co-facilitator, Kate Botherman. Uh, she is not available to join us today. We are meeting on a slightly different day and time than we normally do. Um, but no worries for those that aren't able to attend. We are recording and we will send this out afterwards. So let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a really exciting conversation ahead today where we have two national experts from zero to three will be sharing really fantastic information about their Think Babies campaign and some related efforts. And we always start with this disclaimer slide to remind folks that this Early Childhood Learning Community is funded by SAMHSA, who funds the National TA Network for Children's Behavioral Health. Uh, but the views and opinions that are being discussed today are um, those of the presenters and not of SAMHSA. And this has some special importance for our, our conversation today. So SAMHSA specifically does not engage in advocacy efforts, but luckily in the world of early childhood, we have national leaders like our presenters that you will hear from shortly who do lead lots of great work on education and advocacy and all of that. And you will be lucky to, to hear about their work today. Uh, specifically during the presentation, you will also get some information about the difference between education and lobbying. So I'm not sure, you know, we, we always have lots of diverse folks that are, that are on this call, and some of you are working for organizations that, that have some similar uh, guidelines around participating in advocacy efforts. You'll learn some information that, um, that should help you figure out what, your, uh, you know, what some of the boundaries are of your work. And just please let us know if you have any questions on any of that. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly review our learning objectives today. So we are hoping that by the end of this session that folks will be able to identify the role of family voices in education and related efforts to be able to brainstorm and consider solutions and address challenges that, that help to engage families that have young children in sharing their voices and specifically to hear more about the Think Babies campaign. So in just a moment, I will introduce our presenters, and they will share information for you. Um, that they will share information for you about engaging families in all sorts of different activities. What some of these challenges, what some challenges might be in doing that work. Give some ideas about how to, you know, to, to really get families to think through different ways that they can participate. Um, we'll share a story of success, and as always, we will end with questions and comments. Um, and we will have a, um, a brief uh, evaluation feedback survey link at the end that we hope you will take the time to, um, to let us know how your experience was with us today. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our presenters. I'm going to start with Amanda Perez. She is a Senior Advocacy Specialist at Vera to Three. And as a Senior Advocacy Specialist, Amanda works with this team to develop and implement advocacy cam campaigns on infant toddler issues. Amanda contributes to a variety of written products from Zero to Three's Policy Center and edits, produces, and writes for their weekly, bi I'm sorry, the bi-weekly policy newsletter, The Baby Monitor. Amanda comes to her role with experience as an infant toddler teacher, supported by the Child Care Development Block Grant, an early interventionist under funding from Part C of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and 16 years as a trainer and technical assistance provider with Early Head Start. She has particular expertise in attachment and the pivotal family role in child development and learning. In her current work, she is most interested in engaging families in grassroots advocacy for their young children and communities. And we also, uh, Amanda is joined by her colleague, Lindsay Ursi, who is the Director of Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health at Zero to Three. Lindsay guides Zero to Three's policy agenda on infant and early childhood mental health and leads related technical assistance projects and collaborations. She works at the state and federal level to increase access to and utilization of high quality mental health services for young children and their caregivers. 
She formerly served as a director of special projects for the Institute of Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health at Tulane University School of Medicine, where she was on faculty. She also served as the Louisiana Early Childhood Comprehensive Systems Coordinator for the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals Office of Public Health. Her work has focused primarily on the translation and dissemination of research on infant and early childhood mental health and development to inform policy and programming decisions. So you are lucky to be able to hear from two national experts in the topic they're discussing today and lots of other topics. So I will turn it over to you, Lindsay and Amanda, now. Thank you so much for taking time to share with our community today. Great. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, this is Lindsay. I will kick us off, and then I'll hand things over to Amanda. Um, so first, just to introduce Zero to Three. Um, Zero to Three is a national nonprofit organization with the mission to ensure that all babies have a strong start in life. Um, and we do that by um, doing a whole bunch of different things um, across our different divisions, um, really with the end target audiences being policymakers, parents, and um, early childhood providers of various different sorts. Um, so that work, as you can imagine, encompasses a lot. Um, and Amanda and I are positioned within our policy center at Zero to Three, which is a nonpartisan research-based policy center where we do work across state and federal policy. Um, and in terms of the issues that we work on, you'll hear a little bit more about the policy priorities that we're um, sort of lifting up through our Think Babies campaign. Um, but really, we work on just about every issue that um, directly impacts the lives of infants and toddlers. Um, so we have a pretty expansive um, portfolio of policy issues that we work on um, at the federal level and, and also issues that we support states in, in thinking about as they try to make policy progress in their own context. I'm going to hand it over to Amanda here. Hi, it's so nice to be on with folks. Thank you so much for being here today. And this is kind of a funny question to be asking, um, but we are aware of the sensitivities that come from work that is being supported by um, SAMHSA. And so we have changed our question here from what is advocacy to what is education, really thinking about what is education in a policy context. We wanted to define a little bit about what we were talking about, but what, but what we're really thinking about here is advocacy. So I, I want to kind of put that out there to make sure that we're clear. Um, and we have a lot of fancy ideas, I think, about what, fan, what advocacy can mean. The truth is it's very simple and it's very common, and folks are doing it every day, even though we really attach it so often to this policy context. Asking for what you need and what you want is an early skill for all of us. Asking for what somebody else might need and want is also kind of an early skill. It comes a little bit later, although people tell us, we've heard stories of, um, of children in a nursery, newborn babies in a hospital nursery who are crying, and the echo of the crying um, that comes from the other babies who start to cry with them. So we start very early to connect with one another and to empathize with one another and to ask um, questions for one another and to speak out for one another. And what we're really talking about here is speaking out. Um, I'm looking at our at our participant list, and I'm recognizing a name. Hi, Jerry. Nice to see you there. Um, and we know that there are just a few folks here. So I wondered, here with us today, although I know that we are being taped for, for later, I wondered um, if we could just take a couple of minutes to talk about why you all are here today, and if that's something that you guys can enter into the chat box. Maybe we could we can target something specifically to you all. So why are you all here on this call today? What are you hoping for? Anyone? Okay, I'm not seeing um, I'm not seeing any responses coming in, but I'm thrilled that you guys are here, and hopefully as we're going through, if there are things that you all are interested in that we can speak to, you all will, um, will 
we'll ask those questions and make sure that you put them in the chat box for us, which I think is a possibility. Is that right, Tiara? Yes, that's correct. So the discussion questions okay. can be responded to in the chat. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So we have a poll for you. Tiara is going to put up for us. And um, we, we know that a lot of people are involved with this network, and we wondered how you already engage family voice in your work and nurture families in their advocacy. So we'd love to hear you talk about all the things that apply to you here. How do you engage the family voice? Give you a minute here to respond. So some folks are talking about clinical practice. Other folks are talking about advocacy. And there we're talking about policy advocacy, I'm, I'm imagining, yes? So we're really thinking about those two pieces. Awesome. And, the, and, the, and, our, and our poll is now closed. For those who are listening later, there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways that we support that family voice. Um, in our work, and we do it sort of in every role of their lives. We really think about, if we think about all the ways that we support families in, in sharing what they know and sharing what they feel about the people who are with them and, and how they might be able to help, we know that that happens in a lot of different ways. I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay for a minute now to talk about our Think Babies campaign. Yes, okay, so, th oops. I think we're both moving our slides. <laughs> so um, I'm going to sort of tell you some about our Think Babies campaign um, and the work that we're doing through that campaign. Um, and then Amanda will talk more about um, engaging family voice um, both through the campaign and through um, other means. So with Think Babies, this is a campaign um, that we developed really because we saw the growing gap between current policy and the struggles of families across the country, which I, I imagine resonates with um, those of you on the line. Um, and the campaign is really a call to action for federal and state policymakers to prioritize the needs of infants, toddlers, and their families, and ultimately to invest in our country's future. Um, with Think Babies, um, we are, are really trying to build awareness and political and public will to advance equitable outcomes for infants and toddlers. And in this model, we've created a policy agenda that's holistic in terms of thinking about what families need. Um, we are engaging parents directly in our efforts, um, which is why we're here talking to you about family voice. Um, we're working with a broad range of partner organizations at the federal and state levels um, because we really think that a concert of voices at all levels of government is what's needed to impact change. Um, and we're focused on both advocacy and policy um, because we, we know, and, and really that is a thread through all of our work in the Policy Center, that we need both of those pieces to be um, sort of orchestrated in, in concert um, in order to move the policy needle at the state and at the federal levels. Um, so some core elements of our Think Babies campaign, we have our annual Strolling Thunder event that brings our constituent, brings constituent families to meet with their elected officials. Um, we have a growing network of national advocates and partners across the country, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We also develop um, and this is new, this was uh, first of all this year, our annual State of Babies Yearbook, which provides national and state-by-state -state data on the well-being of America's babies, and that's across a lot of different indicators. Um, and our hope is that that is used to inform policymakers and advocates, and really to equip people with the information that they need to be able to think about their state context um, and identify policy priorities and areas for action that will have the greatest impact for babies in their state. Because we understand that every state is different and um, it's the nature of sort of early childhood systems and early childhood investment that um, some states are miles ahead in one piece of their system um, but might be lagging behind in another place. Um, and so we hope that state by state data can really help folks take a, a deep dive um, to think about what 
their um, what their next move should be in terms of advocacy and policy change that will have the biggest impact for babies. Um, and then with Think Babies, we also have um, a steady drumbeat of digital organizing activities to keep that awareness up and, and maintain momentum. And we also have grassroots partnerships with state and community partners um, to continue to advance those infant toddler um, policy agendas in states. So now we're going to play a video for you. Okay, just to give folks um, some instructions on the video, if you are connected by telephone, you want to go ahead and put your telephone down and um, unmute your computer speakers. So again, put your telephone down and unmute your computer speakers. And I'll give folks about 15 seconds or so to um, go ahead and get situated, and I will play the video. It's a cute face for us to wait on here. Babies. They eat, they sleep, they cry, they do their diaper business, and that's about it, right? Wrong. Underneath the eating, the sleeping, the crying, and the many, many, many diapers, there's a lot going on. Their brains are forming over one million new neural connections every second. And these connections have an impact on how they learn and relate to others for the rest of their lives. Their brains won't wait, so we can't wait either. Now is the time to make sure that our public policies give babies what they need to thrive. That's why we're taking our message from the cribs to the capitals and telling policymakers to think babies. Our first strolling thunder was a huge success. We took our message to Washington, D.C. with hundreds of people, babies and families from all 50 states, and many, many, many diapers. But we've only just begun. We're making Think Babies a national movement, and we need you. Babies can't talk, but you can. So join us and tell policymakers it's time to think babies and to act. <laughs> we'll bring the diapers. Okay, and so we want to make sure that you all get connected back to the audio, so please go ahead and mute your computer speakers and pick back up your telephones. Um, mute your computer speakers and pick back up your telephones, and we'll resume in about 10 seconds or so to give you all time to get uh, back connected. Okay, so uh, with Think Babies, we have a set of policy priorities that we're targeting through this campaign, and those are quality affordable child care, where really our message is that we need to make sure that every family who needs it has access to quality affordable child care, and we really want to emphasize that quality piece. Um, in, in addition to that affordability piece through this campaign. Um, and, and to highlight that that care should offer one-on-one -on -one relationships with caring adults and strong early learning experiences. Um, then our second priority is time for parents to bond with their babies. Um, because we know that we need to give parents dedicated time to bond with their babies in the earliest months. Um, then we're working on healthy emotional development and also on strong physical health and nutrition um, and really trying to talk with policymakers about all of the um, supports and services that families need in order to ensure both healthy emotional development and that strong physical health and nutrition. And through the campaign, we have partnerships and alliances with nearly 70 national and state organizations. Um, and this has been a really um, fun and rewarding part of this work um, because it's given us an opportunity to strengthen existing partnerships and make form new partnerships um, with organizations, some of whom have never had an, an explicit infant and toddler focus. Um, 
uh, for some of our partner organizations who typically work on um, children's issues um, without uh, focusing on an age range. Um, this has been an opportunity to explore the ways that an infant toddler focus can be more explicitly integrated into their work um, and really to bring lots of different kinds of voices and different perspectives and vantage points into the dialogue about what infants and toddlers really need. Um, so our partner organizations um, have taken on a number of different activities, including engaging their networks in Think Babies and Strolling Thunder advocacy, uh, promoting our Think Babies these messages and events to their networks, adding more voices to the Think Babies campaign, um, and promoting significant member or state affiliate engagement activities and state campaigns, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, and also creating Think Babies resources, so co-authoring things with us, um, working on policy pieces um, and guidance that might be useful to the field. Um, and, and a variety of kind of co-created things that we've been able to do through the, through the project. So in states, we've also been able to um, cultivate an element of this campaign or an arm of this campaign. Um, we have partner, partnerships with children's organizations in six states, so they're listed there and our partner organizations are listed there. Um, and they are working in partnership to advocate for state-level policies that support babies and their families um, along that same set of policy priorities that we mentioned before. Um, and these partners bring together a wide range of stakeholders across the private and public sectors to advance that infant-toddler agenda. And in addition to these um, partnerships, we also work with a number of local organizations to build grassroots support for Think Babies. Um, so this has really grown to be a really multifaceted uh, campaign um, and one that we're, we're really, really happy with and, and that has really um, kind of become the, the heart of um, our, our advocacy work uh, at Zero to Three. So I'm going to hand it over to Amanda um, to dig in more to engaging family voice and advocacy. So thank you, Lindsay. So all that you described, a lot of what you described is happening, as you said, in multifaceted kinds of ways. And it's, and it's happening not just at the organizational level. So Lindsay mentioned a little bit about how we bring family voices in. I want to talk a little bit about Strolling Thunder, which is sort of our headliner event um, at, at the Think Babies campaign. And this is where, on the national level, when we're doing this national Think Babies work, we bring in 51 families, one family with a baby from every state in the United States, as well as Washington, D.C. And they come to D.C. and they spend a day with their members of Congress. We have a rally on the Hill where we ask people to think babies. Um, but we really um, work on building these family voices. And we want to talk about sort of what the roles of people are in that. I also want to flag that in each of the states where we have a presence, those states are also doing strolling funder activities, which are happening at their state capitals um, or around the state. And those are to engage those state legislators, who we also know are so important in this policy push. So we really want to kind of address um, what babies need and what families need to thrive. Um, at very different levels and at very different places. And we see a family voice, the role for family voice and all of that. What you all are looking at here is a picture from our National Strolling Thunder. Um, on the left here, you see Chandra, I always mix up her name, Chandra Josh Ippen. And she is um, an incredible um, expert in infant and toddler development, particularly around trauma. She's been doing a lot of work in this field, and she's a member, a board member of Zero to Three. Next to her, we have, um, in the suit, actually, I'll say there, is Karen Bass. And Karen Bass is a representative from California. She's quite extraordinary. She's chair, for, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, um, and she made some time to spend with our Strolling Thunder family. And there, these other folks in the yellow and the babies, of course, are part of that Strolling Thunder family that came in from California from um, Ken Bass's district to speak to her about issues that 
that um, impact babies and toddlers in their states. So one of the things that, you know, it's one of the questions that we can ask about this picture is why these three groups of people? Why do we have a legislator here? Why do we have an expert here? And why do we have this family here to talk about strong thunder? And I wonder, Lindsay, if you can help me out in a little bit of discussion about this. So when you think of the role that um, Karen Bass plays here, the representative plays in this picture, what do you think of? I think of high-level authority and decision-making across a lot of different areas um, with a lot of different responsibilities. Um, hopefully all in service of her constituents. Yeah, so one of the things that's really so important about her role, right, is that she's doing a lot of things. I mean, I think you stated that really well. She's in this very high level, and sometimes people will say she's very powerful in these kinds of conversations, but she's in this very high-level position where her job is to have an eye on all the families in her, in her district and to promote their well-being through a variety of um, things that she's doing at the federal level. So she's got a very wide scope for her work and she and she um, she needs a lot of information in order to do that from a lot of different people the other thing that she does is she knows a lot about government and how government works and how bills are written and what makes sense to be put in a bill and so and so we um, absolutely need her on the team <laughs> So one of the roles of our Strolling Thunder work is to go in and really help people, and I think babies work in general, is to help policymakers understand what is happening in those first three years of life, how important brain development is during that time, um, sort of all the things that they need to know. They need that, they need that basic understanding of this time is a very precious and important developmental time for babies and toddlers, um, and, and we want we want her to know that. So let's think now about what Chandra contributes to this. What about her expertise here? What do you think? So Chandra is able to bring the expert perspective. She has sort of um, highly regarded um, credentials and um, can come in and talk about the science of child development. Yeah, so one of the things that Chandra has that, that is a little bit unique to this is that she has a relationship already with a lot of the representatives there. She's really been out there. She's let people know that she is, um, she is somebody that they can go to when they have questions about how to support babies and toddlers in their communities. Um, and that's a really helpful thing. So she has a relationship, and we'll call her a grass top advocate. Um, but the other thing that she brings is sort of this perspective about the work, right? What does the work look like? How does, how does it function? If she's operating under um, federal policy, what, how, how does federal policy get translated to the work that she does every day and sort of the, the ways that she interacts with babies and families? Um, is she interested in Medicaid? You know, is that a part of what what drives her in her work and sort of what gives her what she needs in order to be able to serve the families in her community. She has a very strong sense of how that policy is implemented where she's at. Um, she also has a pretty broad idea of what's affecting the families in her community if she has that contact with them, and we know that Chandra does. So, you know, what is it that they're bringing to the table that's important to them? and she can really speak to those pieces. I suspect, but I'm not sure, that a couple of you that are, that are participating with us today are in this role sort of as the expert. Maybe it's not something that you've done um, to go to sort of build a relationship with a policymaker, but I'm wondering what it is that you see as your role in the policy process. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity, I know that there's an opportunity for you to, to sort of type in on the chat. We would love to hear from you um, about the kinds of things that you bring or that you think that you would be able to bring to a policymaker and to this process of sort of advocacy in this way. Now, I taught infants and toddlers, so 
I know how to be patient. <laughs> Um, we definitely want to hear from you all. We definitely do. Hmm. And totally not required, of course, of course. Um, but we do feel that you all bring a really important piece to this. A lot of you are working, or some of you may be working in systems, which can be important. A lot of you are working in organizations. You all bring a lot of the, like, where the rubber meets the road information to this policy process. You also have a different role, which I'll talk about in a second here. But let's talk about the family. And I, and I, and I open this to everybody. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, Tiara. I open this to everyone, but what what does the family bring to this process um, in terms of policy making and advocacy? Well, th this is Lauren. Just as, as you're asking yeah. this question, I, I, I just I so appreciate the question. I, I don't think it is a perspective that we always think about. Like to me, it, in all honesty, it, it often feels very separate. Um, so I just, I love this question and I'm, I'm thinking of a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, in some ways it might be, it might feel extremely obvious, right? What the family brings in some ways is like that hard approach. And Lindsay, I, I, you might just be chomping at the bit to respond, but this, they bring <laughs> the story, right? They, they know what their experiences are like. And so we have this opportunity for um, for people to bring their story to people who are making decisions about their lives. There's a parent um, advocacy group called You Plan, and I'm so terrible with um, with names, but I I know You Plan is is burned into me. And what they they talk about is no decision about us without us. And their idea is. You are making decisions about my life, and you should know what my life is like. You need to hear from me about about the things that are affecting me and my family. And also, let's talk about these children and just how gorgeous and compelling they are. Um, sort of as as we go in and really try to talk with um, Representative Bass about both what's happening sort of intellectually and in terms of the research that you mentioned that Chandra brings, but also in terms of, you know, where, where we can hit people in the heart because we know that that's where values change. We know that, that value, I'm sorry, not where values change, but where if we can get to values in our conversations, we can really, um, we can really impact their decision making and their policy. Did you want to add anything I there? Would, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, um, just to elaborate on that a little bit and from a little bit more of a, um, I don't want to say pragmatic, but um, sort of nuts and bolts or brass tacks maybe, I guess, kind of perspective. <laughs> um, you know, in, in my role, I spend a lot of time going um, and talking with folks on Capitol Hill um, with staff, members of staff and, and members of Congress. And one of the things that was really surprising to me, I think when I went from working um, not in D.C. and thinking about what I thought um, Capitol Hill was like and what I thought the federal government was like or what I thought Congress was like, I really um, didn't, uh, I think I undervalued um, family voice or just constituent voice. I undervalued my own voice as a constituent um, and did not maybe understand the influence that that has. And I think one of the things that was most surprising to me in transitioning to my work on the Hill um, is how much more members of Congress value the feedback of their constituents over that of national organizations um, and the, the quote-unquote experts. Um, and I think that really shines through for us in Strolling Thunder as it does in other meetings that I go and take on the Hill um, when I bring constituents um, or when I call in constituents um, for those conversations because those members and those staff are much more interested in hearing from the constituents. Um, some 
some of them, you know, depending on the orientation of the office, they really don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be lobbied, they don't want to be um, educated by, um, you know, the national experts. That is not meaningful for them. Um, they're really thinking about the fact that they're beholden to their voters and to their um, their constituent and their base. And so, um, I think that was an eye-opening um, experience for me. And I think when we can, in the context of strolling thunder, when we can take that constituent voice and bring in the babies. Um, so not only these parents who are who are potential voters and um, people living within their districts or their states, um, but then also this added layer of, as Amanda said, these really beautiful and compelling um, young people. Um, I think it is a, a powerful and a memorable experience for them um, because I think, um, you know, a lot of folks on the Hill are parents themselves and um, understand when a family from Alaska walks into their office with a one and a half year old, um, they understand that that family exerted an immense amount of effort to get there um, and that they really needed to show up in their office and share their story. And so I think that um, it has really reframed for me my whole perspective on um, the value of constituent voice and my own voice as a constituent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Absolutely. The amount of I, – I, I, I love what you said about, about sort of the – the amount of effort that it takes for a family to gather up their children and come to D.C. or even to leave their children back home and come to D.C. or to leave their children back home and come to a meeting at nighttime, you know, at bedtime, those kinds of things. Those are all um, important elements for folks as they're thinking about where is the passion, where is the commitment, what, what does, do families in my district really need? And that constituent vote can matter so much as well. I think we're ready for another poll. So I'm going to ask um, Sierra to open up another one. And, and what we're curious about here is as you all are doing advocacy and when we, answer, when we opened that original question about sort of how you're engaging families, you all talked about, about policy advocacy in particular, but what are the challenges or barriers you've encountered in trying to engage families in advocacy or education efforts or other kinds of um, speaking out? What are the kinds of challenges that you all are finding in doing that? Lots going on for families. So as this is coming up, we're seeing, um, we're seeing a, a vote here for family stress and overwhelm. Anybody else? other things that you're seeing? Um, and sometimes it has to do with like, do I, you know, how do I do this in a way? I don't have, I don't have time. I don't have um, the resources to engage with families in the way that I'm hoping to. That can also be an issue that we don't have listed, listed here. Other things? Okay. Okay. So I think we can end the poll and go back to um, our conversation here. I'm going to forward our, our thinking. So we did the poll. So one challenge that people come to us with is this idea of a conflict of interest. So just as SAMHSA is saying to us, you know what, advocacy isn't really our term. It's not something that we're not in that space of advocacy. We know that a lot of people are sort of funded by um, or beholden to governmental programs or governmental um, funding sources. And so we know that this can be a particular issue for people. Um, when we're talking about conflict of interest here, we, some of us absolutely cannot go in and lobby um, policymakers, but there tends to be this other issue around education that we can do. And what, I do want to flag for you that I'm not a lawyer. I 
I want to make sure that you all are thoughtful about, about the ways in which you do this. But I'm not a lawyer, so if that is somebody that you have on staff um, or somebody, there's a supervisor who you can talk to about this, I would definitely go to them for the final word. But in general, education offers sort of discussion about early brain development. What is happening in brain development is so compelling. So when Chandra goes in there and she's talking about the science of brain development, I mean, we all, um, I think probably on this webinar, get excited about that, about what we know, that a million, every second for a child who's below the age of three, a million neural connections are made every second, a million of them. And if we think about that in terms of brain architecture, that is foundational to all the rest of their learning and you know success through life. So we really want to make sure that we're highlighting that message, that we can bring that in, that they know the expertise that you all build your days around. Um, so important to do that. Education also can tell a story about how a family benefited from a program sort of in the past, something that they've used before, or would have benefited for a program from a program. So for example, when we go in and talk about paid family leave, and we're talking to members of Congress and policymakers, there are some states that have implemented that. There are some states that haven't. And we find that there are a lot of families who have to take or sort of are in a position where they have to take off time from work, unpaid time off of work to take their children to um, early intervention appointments on a regular basis that's really causing them some financial hardship or they have a medical issue within their family that they're really having to deal with. And if we can bring those stories to Congress, that is considered education. Um, on the other hand, if we're talking about lobbying, we're talking about something that references a specific bill. And I'm going to give you sort of these particular bullet points. So it references a specific bill. It references, references a position on a specific bill. We're really talking about very specific legislation, either at the local or the state or the federal level. And it urges a specific action. So if we're trying to get a member of Congress to act in a particular direction on a specific piece of legislation, that is lobbying. So those are the differences. It's a very different kind of theme. Um, and we really, in terms of that lobbying definition, it's very defined. So again, that's, it references a specific bill. It references a position on a specific bill and it urges a specific action. I want you to vote yes or no on this particular bill. Does that make sense? If there are questions about that, I just want to pause here to respond to those. OK, I don't see any coming in. So let's move to this family sense of inadequacy. And for those of, so for those of us that are working with families sort of um, developmentally, we know that when you have very young children, or we think that we know that when you have very young children, it's really a time of transition and adjustment and sort of trying to figure out, like, especially with that first child, what does it mean to be a parent? What is my role here? What am I learning about my baby? And where is my expertise? And so we often find, particularly for first-time parents, that there's this sense of inadequacy. You all might see it if you're doing clinical work in the field, right? That we, we're, we're seeing families who have questions for physicians, for example, and are nervous about asking them or don't feel that they have a role in doing that. Sometimes that's a cultural piece, um, not so much uh, framed as a sense of inadequacy, but framed as a, like, that is my doctor, and I don't ask those questions of, of him or her. Sometimes it's just a general sense of, like, overwhelm. And we know that um, from, from a mental health perspective, there's a lot going on during those early years that can really impact people's ability to feel confident about, about their role as a parent. Um, Everything we ever learned about supporting family voice, we learned from clinical practice. So in all the roles that I've had in terms of supporting families, beginning with, you know, right out of college, working with families as a child care provider in an infant-toddler classroom, all of that clinical work 
inform the work that I do today in bringing families to, to see their members of Congress on Capitol Hill. Um, my, my social work degree was invaluable in doing that, and it was clinical social work degree, right? So I'm trying to bring all of those lessons learned to the work that I do with families as I bring them to Capitol Hill. Absolutely, we work within relationships. We um, are very clear that we do not um, bring in families sort of via a, an interest form that they send in and we say yes and we don't talk to them. We build a very intentional relationship with them before they come here. We talk with them quite a bit um, and we, we um, sort of hold them and their anxieties um, and their joys and their celebrations in coming to see us on Capitol Hill, which we really appreciate. We absolutely recognize and celebrate their role. We do that, um, we do that piece that we did at the beginning with the picture with them to sort of say, you know, what is it that you bring? And very often they go very deep into what they bring. And it's often an emotional story. People don't know, they'll tell us. People don't know what it's like. Um, so those kinds of experiences are really important and we have to we have to let them know how important it is that that policymakers know we are very specific with them about what we are asking them to do one of the things that we've learned is that we are not just bringing in families for one day on Capitol Hill that we now have this this cadre of expert family voices that can that we can rely on to do a number of different things so we have families that are doing doing um, op-eds for us and letters to the editor. Often we write those things for them or we ghostwrite them and then we send them to them for their review to make sure that all is well. But we are definitely being very specific. You know, can you do this letter? This is where where it would appear if it gets accepted. We're not sure that it will be. Um, this is what the content will be. Please review and make sure that this is what you would say. If there's anything that you want to change, please make sure that you do that. We're very clear about sort of every piece of um, of what it is that they're they're putting their story on the line for and their face sometimes on the line for. What does that mean for you? And here's what we think the impact of that will be. When we bring them to Capitol Hill, exactly what will those meetings look like? We want to be as specific as possible. And we don't tell them things that we don't know, of course. We'll say, you know, we're not sure exactly how the congressperson is going to, going to respond, but here are, you know, seven different ways that that congressperson may enter the room. If we think that it's going to be an office that's friendly, we let them know that. If we think it's going to be an office where they might have a little bit of a challenge, we let them know that too. We're as specific as we can be about what it is that we're asking them to do and what we think the impact will be. And again, we're highlighting what they already know and do throughout that process. And finally, we offer examples. You know, here's, here's somebody who's done this before. Here's somebody who is in your position before. And that can be a very powerful piece as well. Um, and, I, and I'll just add here role playing, that we do a lot of role playing work with families um, to give them, again, that very specific idea of sort of what this will be like and to give them a sense of success before they ever enter a room. I think we have another video now. Yeah, so we have a video here from a woman that I worked with in early Head Start, and she came to a, um, a, a presentation that we were doing. She made a presentation in front of about 2,000 people, which was just extraordinary. But she had been in early Head Start for a while, and she tells the story here of, um, of having a son named Gavin, who they had some development concerns about and so they got a screening for her she and early had her early head start home visitor worked together to get a screening and they um, they got that first screening and then they got sent for an assessment and at the assessment they were told that Gavin had autism and Tatum thought about this and she said you know what I don't I don't really think that this that that's what this is I don't think this sounds like autism as I read more about it, I'm pretty sure he doesn't have autism. And so the Early Head Start program heard that, and they supported her in getting a second evaluation. And again, the um, evaluator came back, the assessment came back as uh, identifying Gavin as having autism. And Tatum said, you know what? I just don't think that that's the case. 
and the home visitor said, I support you. And they got a third assessment for her son, and she tells the story of what that was like. So we can hear that and now. These devices, I've never seen this, these type of toys before, and she's just playing with them and doing these things, and she sat with him for about 15 minutes. <laughs> And Trisha said, Tatum, your son has a visual impairment. He is an autistic, but his behavior with visual impairment might make people suggest that he's autistic. It's your son is partially blind. Wow. And I said, thank you, Trisha. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about. This is what we and me and Barb were thinking, that this is what was wrong with Gavin, that it had to be his eyes. It was his eyes. And she knew, she knew what we were going through. It just washed away. And every time I speak of her, I get so emotional because she was the first one to hear me. Oh, do you don't know what it's like. It's so hard not to have people that are professionals in your corner. They they get so you know, they go so book wise and they don't they don't hear you after a while. And then they're like, Well, you wouldn't know. I have the education. I know. You don't and that's wrong. Because I knew what was wrong with my son and they should have trusted that. And birth to three early head start, head start trusted that. They, be, they came to me as parents themselves, concerned about my own child, as if, as if my baby was theirs. Mm -hmm. That's an extraordinarily powerful. So I wonder, um, every time I see her, I just am so moved. She really... Um, if you can imagine her in front of 2,000 people sharing this story about the impact of their work um, on her life. I, I, anyway, I get very emotional. I wondered, thank you, Lauren. I see, I see your comment here about how beautiful and moving that was. I'm wondering if anybody else had any other comments about that. No pressure, of course. Oh, well, th yeah. this is Lauren, and I just, oh, gosh, I, I, it's hard to know where to, where to start with something like that. And I mean, what a, not only an extraordinary story, but just what a, an, an impressive, articulate, you know, phenomenal mom and, you know, an advocate to, to not only work so hard for her son as she did, but then to share that message. That's just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, she, um, she is amazing, and I can see her in a number of different contexts being able to do that, but I really sort of being able to share that story and what would that be like for, for the folks who had done those earlier assessments to know and what is it like for other early Head Start staff to know and what is it like for policymakers who are watching, who are trying to understand the impact of early Head Start and particularly their family support um, elements, what is it for them to have that story in their pocket? Um, anyway, I just, I, it just really moved me. So, um, so we know that sort of the work that's happening on a clinical level can really be translated again into the kinds of things that folks are doing in terms of policy advocacy. Here is a family who was supported in her advocacy as she was being supported in moving her, getting her child the appropriate diagnosis. And that, message, I think, about the power of your work in terms of the clinical work that folks are doing is really important. Okay. Move on to the second slide. I'm not sure that I can push this next here. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So we're talking about family stress. Um, when we did our poll, somebody was talking about sort of how this was an issue that was particularly relevant in, the, in trying to get families to, to um, express themselves and use their voices. And we know that that happens in a variety of different contexts. It's not just that we have a meeting, right? But it's also that 
you know, that we have a meeting in D.C. and people have to come, and how do we manage family stress in that context? But it's also that, you know, sometimes there's stress, as we said earlier, in terms of just raising your voice, in terms of just sharing your story. And so there are a lot of different ways that we can impact, um, that we can support families as, as we're asking them to advocate. One is that we think about how we include children, right? So for us, we are, we are, we are asking families of children to share their stories. And so we know that they're coming, and we know that they have children. So we have to think of the ways that the children are going to be present there. And some of that is um, there are some contexts, of course, in which we have to be very careful when we're, when we're including children, that there are privacy issues and confidentiality issues that come up. We have to be extremely respectful about those pieces, um, but we have to think about how we're including children in that way. Um, Offering food and covering expenses, we know that that's extremely important. You know, we have to be thinking about that, considering the meeting times and being as flexible as we can be to what families need, especially families with young children whose schedules might change rapidly. Um, when I was doing home visiting, I tried to be very clear with families that I was coming at a particular time. But if that wasn't a good time for them, we needed to find a different time, right? We have to make sure that folks are participating because that we sort of remove all barriers to their participation. We're so lucky right now to have a time of such incredible technology. There are a lot of ways to include family voice online um, and on the phone and through different media. Um, on a Facebook Live conversation. Um, there are just so many ways to engage families through Instagram and sort of sharing their voice through Instagram, through thinking about graphics and how we might use a quote from a family on a graphic and have a, a powerful experience with that as well. Um, and again, here we go to including lots of options and opportunities. We definitely want to make sure that we don't lock families into one way to participate, that we, that we absolutely prioritize their voice and we say, we're going to work around you to get this done. And then keep families in the room even when they can't be there. So I know at Zero to Three, Lindsay and I sit in conference rooms that are covered with the faces of families and with children, that we have those photographs on the wall, that we can look up there and remember who it is that we're there for. Um, sometimes I've been at meetings where folks are not able to attend and there's a photograph of that person like in a, like in a little stand-up frame that we put at a table somewhere so that we can remember that that person is in the room, that that person's voice matters. Um, and, we, and we do that very little because we absolutely want that voice to be there, but we have to remember their presence in the room. Um, this bottom line is that we make family input absolutely unquestionably necessary. So we have a lot of concerns about resources. I know that it can be expensive. We know that there are costs associated with making sure that families do this. So this is a budgeting question. How are we going to make sure? What are we going to do? And you know, this is early in the planning, but what are we going to do to make sure that families are at the table, that they can share their voice? What is it going to be? Is it going to be a survey? Are they? Are we going to be able to do that? How, what's the cost for that? What if families? You know, what if reading isn't their their jam? You know, do we? How do we get information from them in a different way? And what are the costs associated with that? And I would always bring in families to advise you um, on on how they can how they can participate, how they would advise that you collect information from other families. Any questions or comments? Add there. Yeah, go ahead, Lindsay. Yeah, one thought to add there, Amanda, in terms of thinking about um, sort of, but it was your comment about budgeting um, and that this is a budget conversation. I was thinking about the way we budget our financial resources and then also the way we budget our time when we're working with families um, and engaging family voice. And when we were preparing for this, webinar, I was thinking about um, with Sterling Thunder specifically um, and sort of the cultivation of that network of families that you guys have done, um, how the work had changed each year and, you know, the ways in which that reflected kind of lessons that we've learned along the way and improvements that we've tried to make um, to the process. And I think um, one of the things that has really stood out is that we've, we've really um, adapted the 
time that we spend with families to prepare them for um, for their Hill visits. And I think your team has, from the beginning, had always lots of time and availability um, leading up to the event. So from when you guys recruit the families um, all the way up until they show up in D.C., there's such effort that goes into making sure that they know who their points of contact are, that they have multiple conversations um, and get to build a relationship that feels familiar to them, um, that they're able to have the space to talk through their story and talk about how their story connects to policy and really kind of work on getting that, um, that language to a place that feels comfortable to them. Um, and then when they're actually in D.C. for the event, I know that we have made some changes over the years to really expand the sort of training day um, or the prep day that we have with families. Um, and we end up dedicating a lot of um, staff time and financial resources to, you know, holding the space and bringing in um, enough folks to really make sure that every family is having the time that they need to be able to talk through everything, get their nerves out, um, ask all the questions that they want to ask. And, you know, it ranges from, you know, it's all the things that we would wonder as well, but it's everything from, like, what do I need to know about going through the metal detectors to, you know, how do I say this thing I want to say about IDEA Part C. Um, and so I, I think that that concept of budgeting our financial resources and also really budgeting our time um, to make sure that parent voice um, is brought into the room in a way that feels really um, genuine and true and that is comfortable for the parent so that they're not feeling stressed um, by that experience and so that they're feeling really confident and fully equipped and and like they're backed up by a team of people who are really invested in them having a good experience. Yeah, I'm so glad you raised that. Absolutely, that we, we do invest that time. And I, I guess I was thinking as you said that, that um, I'm grateful to the to the leadership at Zero to Three that is that um, makes space for me to have this be such a large part of my job, that there's a budget for that, that and that it's absolute commitment for that, and that we do try and, and grow from the evaluation that we get from families. So it's been interesting to sort of see the evolution of this, and it might be sort of helpful for folks to hear that when we first went to um, Congress that we really were talking just about education and our funding really limited us to talk just about edu about those education pieces. So we brought these stories, we brought sort of the education piece about what's important about infants and toddlers and that, that time of development um, and, and sort of, so we brought both the, both the facts and the story, but what we didn't have is the ask. And that's what we call sort of the policy link for people, right? So we really wanted to make sure that we were, that we wanted to make sure that we didn't talk about that policy ask because that's part of that lobbying definition, right? We don't want to get into that space. And what we found was that not, that the policymakers were asking us for the ask. So they really wanted us to sort of bring in for them, um, what it was, very specifically, very concretely, they wanted us to do a little bit of lobbying there, right? Like they wanted us to make as many connections. They've got very complicated lives. And as you said about Karen Bass in the beginning, Representative Bass, you know, she's thinking about a lot of different things. So we want to make things as clear as possible for them. And their staffers wanted that too. Um, and the other thing that was interesting, Lindsay, is that families wanted to do that too. They wanted to come in and like for them to feel one of the things that they were looking for is um, a sense that, that their story was making a difference and they wanted some sort of measurement or understanding of, of how to look at that. And, and so one of the things that we were able to do over time is really change some of what we had planned. We had sort of planned on sitting down with them and kind of getting the logistics out and making sure they felt comfortable telling their story. But what we learned is that they wanted to build an additional comfort in the policy piece. 
what is it this policy is about? Is it something that I can commit to? Is it something that I agree with? And and when they when they sort of get to that piece, then then watching them in those meetings, I hope you've seen it over the years, Lindsay, has really been a different thing. Like they really feel a, that they have a voice in every part of that process. So thank you for raising that. All right. I want to talk for a minute about confidentiality concerns. I don't think that this is particularly revolutionary for, every, for anyone here on the phone, but we absolutely have to protect family confidentiality in every way. We're very clear about getting releases. We have had families in the past who have said, not my child on social media. We have, um, we've done different things to sort of identify those children, and we have like little pieces of tape on their back so that we know that if we get a picture of them, that that is not a picture that ever goes out. Um, we identify them with photographs for um, our comms team and those kinds of things. We want to make sure that we never violate any kind of um, um, trust that a family has put in for us. Um, we do get those releases, and we also are really clear about getting permission every time. We want to make sure that we that nobody is ever surprised by their picture on um, uh, on a newspaper article or online. We want to make sure that they always know when their family is being represented, and we we reach out to them and are very clear with them about sort of what it is we're hoping to do and get their permission. And finally, we support families in setting their own boundaries. One thing that um, I know is that I can talk for a long time, and a lot of things can spill out of my mouth before I've even thought about what it is that's spilling out. And what we want to do is for families, particularly families with, with challenging stories, is we want to make sure that they are comfortable setting boundaries around what it is they want to share. So often, I'll have a first conversation with families, we'll get a story sort of evolving and on paper, and um, I send it back to them, and I have them think about, okay, if this came out in a member of Congress's office, would I feel comfortable? Um, and that part of things is sort of, can be very important, particularly for families who have experienced violations of boundaries in the past. They, they do want to sort of make sure that um, their minds are they sort of put the boundaries in their minds um, for this very unusual situation, and so we do that as well. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish Congress knew that rare does not mean hopeless. That families like mine struggle every day with diaper need. That there are working moms in Northeast Louisiana that are having to walk away from their job because of the lack of paid leave for their sick children. That I spend more on two children in childcare every month than I spend on my mortgage. So just a few of the messages that um, families are bringing to Congress, uh, that they brought to Congress in 2019, um, and we were so grateful to have them be a part of that experience um, with Think Babies. We promised you a success story, and I want to tell our success story, a story of what, hap what can happen when family voices are raised, and these are the Hibbins from New Mexico. They came to our um, Selling Thunder in 2017, so one of our first families to come. Samuel there, Sam, is a veteran, a medically retired, actually, combat veteran. He was in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and his wife, Jessica, sort of talks about herself as, as a quiet advocate um, before um, she had their baby Rafe, and Rafe is there in Sam's arms. You see him there. Um, it's funny because Jessica was actually raised in advocacy a little bit. Her dad does a lot of work around special needs in New Mexico or around people with special children in particular with special needs in New Mexico. And, and when Rafe was born, um, Jessica hadn't really thought about sort of this piece of, of um, what's happening for children across the country. 
but she was suddenly thrown into a situation. So at about eight days old, she started to suspect that something might be going on with Rafe. And um, she went into a medical provider's office, and she already had some advocacy skills and some expertise, and she sort of given to her through, um, through her work um, with her dad and sort of, I'm sorry, through her family relationship with her dad and growing up with him. But she started asking questions, and he was very unresponsive to her. He thought that Rafe was fine. He didn't want to send Rafe to early intervention. He was not interested. Well, Jessica wasn't having that. <laughs> so she, uh, she, um, she got him assessed, and they found out that he actually had some very significant developmental delays, intellectual delays, physical delays. He has something called cortical visual impairment, um, which is a, a legal type of blindness. Um, so he's really got some particular issues, and she spent the last four years of his life really advocating for him. Um, when I spoke to Jessica for the first time, she was sitting in a Houston airport. She was far from her home in New Mexico. She had traveled with Rafe to a hospital there that could potentially offer him the very specialized surgery that she had researched for him and she felt had the most hope in terms of him um, being able to see. The surgeons didn't accept her insurance. She's on medical insurance or on uh, military insurance as well as Medicaid. Um, and the hospital was not feeling like they could accept this insurance for that surgery. But she scheduled the surgery anyway. <laughs> she had found some um, really supportive folks back um, in, in her hometown in New Mexico who were helping her with therapies for Rafe, who were um, willing to go with her. She sort of said, you know, I wonder about this new therapy for him. I wonder about this new um, procedure for him. What do you think? What do you think? Here's something that I found in Houston. Do you think I should go there? And so they, they, they supported her efforts to learn more about her child and to follow her lead um, in terms of what it was that she needed to do. Um, but she, she, despite not having the insurance coverage for this procedure, she, she scheduled it anyway. And um, she was pretty sure that through her advocacy, something could happen there. When she came to D.C., she visited, or they all visited, with a staffer in Senator Heinrich's office. Her name was Elizabeth Hill, as well as with Representative Lujan and Senator Udall. And in every office, the Hibbins shared the Think Babies messages and made them real as they described their journey and established connections and relationships with people in the room. What I will say is that on our end, we had done all of the relationship building that we could with this family. We really answered, you know, she was um, one of those families that called and asked a lot of questions. We heard from her often. She had a lot of um, um, just questions about how she could be most effective, and we were as responsive as we could be to her. We also wanted to make sure that um, members of Congress's offices were set up for Rafe in his wheelchair and uh, his, his little stroller that he had, and that they would be prepared for, for him to come in. Um, and they absolutely were. So that was really lovely, um, but a, just a small part, part of participation or um, support for this family as they were moving through this process. Um, so they described these Think Babies messages. They sat down with Elizabeth Hill in Senator Heinrich's office, and she was a new mom herself. And when Jessica and Samuel told her Rafe's story, they moved her actually to tears. She was so moved, in fact, that she came down to walk in our rally with us. She hadn't planned to, but she came down to walk. We actually had a stroll that year, and we did a stroll around the, around the Capitol grounds, and we had Ms. Hill with us. So she, um, she came down to commit herself as an advocate for Rafe, which was really awesome. Senator Udall, so in another office, um, they found a longtime supporter of Medicaid, Senator Udall, um, and he found a compelling story and voice in the Hibbins. Um, in May of that year, he shared a photo of the Hibbins and their story during a discussion on the Senate floor, which was, which was amazing to have him speak to their story as he was defending Medicaid from cuts and, um, and advocating for expansion 
In July of 2017, he included them in a video about Medicaid. He did that again later, um, just this year, I believe. And in 2019, when Medicaid was um, threatened again, you'd all held the Hibbins photo alongside other members of Congress and photos of families in their districts who would be affected by a Medicaid cut during a media opportunity. So that relationship has really lived and thrived, and she is now a grass top influencer for, um, for Senator Udall, which is really helpful for us. She's also now an OT school, occupational therapy school. She's amazing doing all kinds of things. But remember how I said that Rafe needed that surgery and Jessica felt determined to find a way? Well, when Jessica and her family met with Representative Lujan, they talked about the hospital bills that were awaiting them in Houston. And within a few short days of the meeting, Representative, Representative Lujan called the hospital in Texas, and after a short deliberation, the hospital decided that they would pay 100% of that $25,000 surgery. So this is a story that has implications, not just for Jessica and Rafe and Samuel, not just for their baby, but for their community as Jessica goes back to school as an occupational therapist, and for the country as their senator is so connected to this fight for Medicaid. Um, and we're really proud of them, and we have so many other stories, maybe not quite at that level of power, but, um, or sort of, um, anyway, different stories evolve in different ways and different people are doing different things, but it's always exciting to see those pieces. I think we have time for a couple of questions if people have those. And as we're waiting for those, for you all to think about what those might be, I wanted to share these tools for use. Um, as you all are doing advocacy in your communities or states, and as you're thinking about how to support families, Zero to Three has quite a few resources that are available to you, both through the Think Babies campaign and through our Zero to Three website. So I just want to flag here that we have things like graphics there on the left, um, memes, we have some story memes that are available for folks um, that tell some stories, particularly about Page Family Leave and Early Head Start right now. We have advocacy toolkits that include things like talking points and sample op-eds and things that you can really engage families with in that way. Um, we've got um, planner pieces that have to do with things like how to plan a site visit for your policymakers or to write a letter to the editor or um, you know, how to have an effective visit with your member of Congress or your policy maker um, more local to you. We also have some really interesting information on infant and early childhood mental health, um, largely through Lindsay's team, which we're delighted to share. Some of those are for policy makers, but they can be lovely things for families to hand off. Um, um, and they're also for your use to learn more about infant and early childhood mental health, if that's an interest for you within within policy. And we have some infographics and basic information as well. Sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, no, I was just going to add that, um, well, two things, actually. Now that you've mentioned the infant and early childhood mental health resources, I will say that um, we have a relatively new resource that's just a really simple infographic that talks about sort of the fact, it gives the definition of infant mental health, but then it talks about um, the fact that every system really has a role to play in promoting and ensuring the, um, the mental health of infants and toddlers. And that piece, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on from folks who've um, used it in policy conversations. Um, and so I feel like I just keep People keep mentioning it to me, I'm like, oh, that's such a good piece, because I think it gives people, provides a, a jumping off point um, just from one page um, for a lot of different conversations that people want to have about infant mental health. Um, so just to, to flag that that's one that seems to be, um, have, have been being helpful for folks lately. And then also, I just, I love that, um, that the advocacy team has developed the how to plan a site visit for your policymakers because um, that's one that I think for folks working in state state or local policy, um, you know, we've seen and heard so many stories of really powerful 
policy change happening in states and communities from from people who are able to actually take policymakers into spaces where children go. Um, I, I um, have worked in Louisiana for a while before I came to DC and um, you know just one example there was that a lot of the momentum that happened in that state around um, quality child care came from an effort where a bunch of state legislators agreed to um, go on a field trip and they got taken through high quality centers and they got taken through centers that were really struggling um, to to ensure quality and they had this sort of awakening when they were kind of standing in the middle of this center that was really well intentioned and really struggling to get by because there were just not enough resources um, and realized you know no children should be in a setting that isn't high quality and no providers should be struggling in this way to take care of children in the way that they know is right. Um, and and that was really um, an impetus for a lot of important policy conversations that, that really snowballed into um, major legislation and systems reform. And so I think, and, and we've heard other stories like that um, because, you know, we all know that experiences can be so powerful. So I think it's really neat um, because while those can be so powerful, it is really daunting to think about um, how you go about planning a site visit um, that's going to feel worthwhile and um, is respectful of everybody who's in the site that you're visiting um, and all of that. So I think um, that piece of guidance is just a great resource on the site. Well, and I'll just say that families are such an important part of that as well. So if you can plan a site visit, um, that is an incredible way to engage families in it. Here's somebody who's coming to learn about your program. We want them to hear about it from the families who are who are impacted by it and um, and to prepare families in that way um, or or for those visits and to have them participate in those visits can be an extremely important and effective um, part of those visits. Absolutely. Okay, well, I think we are about at the end of our time. Um, and of course, people should feel welcome to follow up with Amanda and myself. Um, I think our contact information is, uh, yeah, right here on this slide. Um, and we are always more than happy to um, to field questions or have conversations with people who want to talk about this work. I'll just say that I'm so grateful that folks hung in there with us and um, we're a part of this conversation. <laughs> I am. You will have such an important role in helping people feel their voice and I um, are sort of exposing the voice for people and I am grateful that you took this time with us. Yes, so this is Lauren again and an enormous thank you to Amanda and Lindsay for preparing such a thoughtful presentation. You gave us wonderful information that is just cut and dry information that lots of us need to know. And then you shared stories, made this really feel, you really made this work come alive. And um, I also want to speak for myself and say it was really inspirational to hear uh, about all these, these different efforts that you have going on. Um, so I know we are just about at the end of our time. Um, please do take the survey for those of you that were able to, to hang in with us this afternoon. Um, we are always curious